Good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Chatham House event on Ukraine-Russia coexistence. Is there a viable strategy? Uh, while um, we are having our participants joining, I'd like to welcome you and I wish you all the good 2021. This is the first event uh, hosted by Ukraine Forum at the Russia and Eurasia program. And we're really pleased to open the, the new year with you know, a discussion on a, what we believe is a super important question for bilateral relations of Ukraine and Russia, but for the same matter for the wider European security um, architecture. So my name is Arisa Lutsevich and I am the head of Ukraine Forum and Research Fellow at Chatham House. Uh, and I'm joined today by an excellent panel. I would like to start by announcing that our event today is on the record. Uh, we will be also recording this uh, discussion and uh, posting uh, most of it on the Chatham House website. So you can also share it with those who could not join us today if you think that it's a valuable information and we hope so. So Ukraine-Russia relations uh, are not showing much uh, room for, Im for improvement and the countries having a very low bilateral short of de uh, declaring a war now for seven years. Uh, it has started with the annexation of Crimea and the military operation in Donbass. And of course, two sides are now at the very dangerous standoff with quite large numbers of military personnel uh, staged on the Ukrainian border. Some Russians are being deployed as we have seen it inside Ukraine at the crucial battles, but also Ukrainians that are guarding a quite long contact line on the Donbass region across from the occupied uh, Crimea and Ukraine has lost control of uh, a major part of its Ukrainian Russian border. And over time, we do see that there is a precarious balance that has established where Russia on one hand cannot fully exercise its objectives, but Ukraine for the same matter is not able to restore full control over its territory and is under constant um, pressure from various hybrid threats internally. What we have seen also since the start of the armed conflict is a plunge of the public opinion attitudes towards uh, Russia inside Ukraine and towards Ru Ukraine uh, inside Russia. In Ukraine at the 2014, for example, almost 80% of Ukrainians had favorable attitudes to Russia. Today, the number stands at around 40% and 60% consider Russian an aggressor. Inside Russia, uh, the views on Ukraine are also quite negative. About half of Russian population considers Ukraine a friendly nation, but also the armed conflict and the use of Russian troops on the territory of Ukraine is quite unpopular in Russia. But on a deeper level, there seem to be um, this entrenched um, uh, Ukraine problem inside Russia where Putin personally takes Ukraine close to his heart, and he sees it as an um, almost um, indispensable part for his geostrategic objectives, especially on the European co continent. And there's a deep symbolic meaning for Ukraine that on one hand, Ukraine is trying to say we are not Russia, but Russia is trying to say we are one people, one nation in a way almost. So what we see over time is that the Minsk uh, protocols and agreements has managed to set up a bit less fire, but not even full ceasefire. And uh, on the other hand, Russia managed to damage relations with Ukraine, but not defeat Ukraine completely. At the same time, EU and Russia sanctions managed to, in a way, damage, uh, damage Russia, inflict some serious cost, but not defeat Russia. And there's a lot in this mix that we would like to discuss, not perhaps of an immediate, but of a mid-term to long-term strategy, how the two countries can move along to a more, um, I would say, peaceful coexistence. So I have an excellent panel with me today, and I will introduce speakers in the order that they will be presenting. We'll start with Nadia Arbatova, who is known to many of you. She's joining us from Moscow. She's the head of department on European political studies at the Primakov National Research Institute of World Economy and International Relations at the Russian Academy of Science. She is deeply uh, informed, a well-known expert on EU-Russia relations, on European integration, 
and also on Russian foreign policy. She will be followed by Alexander Litvinenko, who is joining us from Kiev. He's the director of the National Institute of Strategic Studies. Uh, prior to that, for five years after the Euromaidan, he was deputy secretary of the National Security and Defense Council. Uh, for some of you, you know him in 2013, he was studying at the Royal College of Defense Studies in London. And um, Alexander has co-authored uh, a, a paper for Chatham House, which is called A Ghost in a Mirror, Russian Soft Power in Ukraine. That was in 2012. It's, it's, it's interesting actually to reread it. I looked at, at some of its uh, conclusions before this event. So I really recommend because uh, uh, you could see how uh, a situation evolved from 2012 to today. And last but not least, our own James Sher, of course, who is an associate fellow at Chatham House. He's also senior fellow at the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. Currently, he's based in Tallinn. And James is the um, one of those experts who re combine a rare knowledge of intimate and deep understanding of both Ukraine and Russia. And I think that is a very valuable, uh, he'll bring very valuable insights to our conversation today. His, um, uh, actually, his recent publication that I would really advise is called Nothing New Under the Sun, called a Continuity and Change in the Russian Foreign Policy Towards Ukraine. But Nothing New Under the Sun is with a question mark. Uh, so that was released in September of 2020. So as you see, we have an excellent panel. They will speak for about um, 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll move to invite you for question and answers. But right now, I'd like to pass on the floor to Nadia. Nadia, over to you, please. Uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude for the invitation to this interesting event. Uh, and let me start my short presentation with two preliminary remarks. First, I'm going to present my personal understanding of Kremlin's logic, um, political motivation and objectives regarding uh, Ukraine. Second, let me say a few words about the paper presented by my Ukrainian colleagues. I find uh, many interesting and fair statements and points uh, in this document. But as far as they are fair, unfortunately, they are irrelevant um, for solving the main problem, a peaceful settlement of the conflict. Uh, and let me quote this document because uh, this quote is very, it is related to the topic of my presentation. The response uh, to the Russian challenge must be consistent and based on the implementation of a strategic course for Ukraine's uh, membership in the EU and NATO. Will this uh, parole of honor repeated several times in this document help Ukraine to stop a creeping warfare and find a compromise with Russia. I have serious doubts about that because it was exactly EU and NATO enlargement strategies presented as two complementary processes that caused negative reaction of Russia first in Georgia and then uh, in Ukraine. Although Russia's incorporation of Crimea is widely perceived in the West as a turning point in the Russia-West relations, I think that the real roots of this conflict uh, are much deeper. And the the current crisis stems from the profound misunderstanding of each other's views uh, regarding acceptable foundations uh, of the post, uh, post bipolar European security and rivalry in the post Soviet space, in the CIS space, which is viewed uh, by Kremlin as Russia's natural habitat as a sphere of its special interests. 
uh, these uh, differences, in my view, um, are reconcilable, and they are always translated only into one question, who violated the post-bipolar order? And it is impossible to reduce these different uh, views to a common denominator, because we look at the same problems from very different angles. So I think it is useless to waste time and we should think about um, common strategy, the strategy out of this uh, vicious circle. Uh, however, the, conf the Ukraine conflict, like a drop of crystal clear water, reflects three main contradictions of the post-bipolar international relations. First, the contradiction between nations' right for territorial integrity and nations' right for self-determination. Second, the contradiction between nations' right for sovereignty and nations' right for humanitarian intervention. And third, nations' right to freely choose security alliances and nations' right to oppose the expansion if it is assessed as a security threat. Uh, the fact is that after the end of the bipolarity, great uh, powers started to apply these principles uh, selectively according to their foreign policy interests and preferences. For themselves and for their allies, they always preferred the principles of territorial integrity. For opponents, principles of self-determination. Like it or not, uh, Kosovo was the first case of such a selective approach. So Kremlin became uh, convinced that uh, if the United States as a leader of the Western world considered itself entitled to dismember countries and change regimes, um, thousand miles away, uh, Yugoslavia, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Russia had the right to do the same in its immediate neighborhood where Russian security, humanitarian and economic interests were directly affected. What Russia wants in Ukraine? As we see in Russia, everything is not as simple as it looks. It's much simpler. And uh, Kremlin uh, wants Ukraine to stay neutral. I don't think that uh, it has other plans about Ukraine because it has already come to terms with the thought that Ukraine will never be the pearl in the Eurasia Union crown. So uh, Russia, um, in my view, would be satisfied with the, with the fact that Ukraine uh, will stay neutral like other Guam countries. At the same time, Russia, or better to say Kremlin, understands that a new Yalta agreement between Russia and the West over the heads of Ukraine and other Guam countries is impossible. Theoretically, the terms of their neutrality could be discussed in the format of a new Helsinki summit or Paris summit. But uh, this summit, this well, summit, can it uh, take place in the situation of the creeping warfare in Ukraine? So uh, peace in Ukraine is the necessary precondition for further um, fundamental discussions between Russia and the West and Ukraine. It looks that we are trapped in a vicious circle. However, there is a way out of this cir circle. Uh, 
A complete cessation of violence in southeastern Ukraine is the essential first precondition of uh, Minsk implementation, and it would require a big, a full-scale peacekeeping operation um, authorized by the UN Security Council. After uh, the beginning of the conflict, our institute uh, came forward with this idea, but for a long time, this idea was rejected by Ukraine, Russia, and the West. Now, uh, almost everybody recognizes that there is no alternative to this idea. However, there are still uh, profound differences about the model of a peacekeeping operation. The West uh, and Ukraine are in favor of the so-called Kosovo model, according to which peacekeeping forces should be stationed should be stationed throughout the self-proclaimed people's republics, including on the border with Russia. But uh, in my view, there is a big difference between the Kosovo situation and uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. Kosovars wanted foreign troops on their territory. They really wanted um, their deployment while the population of Donetsk and Lugansk uh, does not want foreign troops on their territory. So there is a big difference. And I don't think that this model will be acceptable. Russia is in favor of the so-called Cyprus model with uh, uh, the, uh, the multilateral contingent equipped with armored vehicles, artillery, aviation, drones, should be deployed along the corridor between two ceasefire lines resulted from the Minsk I and Minsk II agreements. This contingent should have the right to open fire in self-defense to stop violations of ceasefire and to ensure the pullback of heavy weapons to the agreed distances from the conflict zone. Of course, uh, this would be only the first step. Uh, peace uh, won't be restored overnight. It will be the first step and it is necessary to create uh, conditions for political uh, solution. The first step towards a complete uh, settlement. The format and composition of these peacekeeping forces Mm, should be a subject of discussion between Russia, Ukraine, and uh, the West. And this is where I see the role of uh, the EU and NATO. They can help to work out a compromise on mutually uh, acceptable and realistic terms. The latter is particularly important because, as we say in Russia, the best is the enemy of the good. Unfortunately, maximalism and perfection are impossible in conflict resolution. And the good should be our common goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. I think you've outlined some of the important points in the I, I, I would second with you the Kremlin strategy towards how uh, it, it would like to see Ukraine's neutrality, non-alignment, perhaps not uh, uh, intimately integrated with the Russia-centric um, project, such as Eurasian Economic Union, but uh, friendly to it and in close cooperation with it. Now, of course, uh, uh, the armed conflict in Ukraine swang, as I said, uh, a political class and there's a new center west majority that has formed inside Ukraine and I'm sure Alexander will allude to that to where uh, uh, Putin's actions actually led to a very different outcomes on the ground in Ukraine in terms of support for both European Union and NATO and uh, uh, led to a certain rethinking of uh, bilateral 
uh, relations, how, you know, how, how strategic is Russia a partner of Ukraine? That question went into an oblivion after all those events that took place. But now I would like to turn into Alexander, who will present his view. And uh, uh, Alexander, I don't know that document that you shared with us, whether we can share it with the group, the, the one that Nadia referred to, because I'm not sure our, our audience was, was aware of that policy brief that you prepared at the National Institute of Strategic Studies. So just please let us know. Go okay. ahead. First of all, I am really thankful to Chatham House and uh, Ukrainian Forum for this opportunity to share with you our point of view on the crucial, vital uh, issue of Ukraine, uh, for Ukraine, Ukrainian-Russian uh, uh, relations. The secondary small disclaimer, I am very sorry for my very, very Ukrainian English, but I hope you can understand me. Uh, before I am going to the presentation, I have uh, I will have to make two uh, small uh, reference to, uh, <coughs> reference footnotes. First of all, uh, from my point of view, the cru uh, the crucial key problem in Ukrainian Russian relations is a great huge lack of trust mutual trust. In 2010, Ukraine tried uh, to go to neutrality. And in one year after this, Russia start strong pressure to us to join custom union and Eurasian uh, union. And uh, many people remember that our condemns uh, tend to strengthening Russian press against Ukraine, uh, to, uh, toward Ukraine. And the second one about peacekeeping cooperation, I want to remember that Ukrainian National Security and Defense Council um, made a decision on uh, the 3rd of uh, March of 2015, March of 2015, about, about invitation of peacekeeping forces. Mm -hmm. Ukraine always, at least since 2015, supported idea of peacekeeping, uh, peacekeeping uh, forces, but we had a big uh, difference in our position with Russia about the place where these uh, forces have to deploy. It. Ukraine insists that it uh, must be on the contact line and the border with Russia, and Russia said only about uh, contact line. Okay, thank you so much for this, and I will start my presentation. I try to be uh, quick, uh, give you two uh, for the opportunity to see this uh, policy brief, and it is on, on, on the site of uh, National Institute for Strategic uh, Studies. Uh, a few fundamentals we, which are the main basis for our policy brief. Russia is a long-term factor of uh, Ukrainian politics, uh, which are in this situation are very affected by imperial legacy and not uh, to be compressing, uh, comparison potentials. Uh, Russia much, much bigger than we, and unfortunately ma much more rich, uh, much richer than Ukraine. Right now, GDP per capita is more than three times bigger in Russia. Russia now, we, unfortunately, we have to uh, say that Russia is the main source of external threats for Ukraine. Strategic courts for joining the EU and uh, NATO, which uh, Nad Nadezhda said, it's a part of Ukrainian constitution and uh, very important. I want to stress the changing of this uh, uh, 
uh, idea of this course, we can be tent for your uh, for collapse of our country. It's a reality. We tried to do this in 2010 and obtain the situation of 2013, 2014. The revolution of dignity, which uh, put Ukraine on the verge of the huge uh, problem of 2014. Uh, we have to understand the return to the situation of 2013 is impossible. Uh, the very important for Ukraine, it's a very Ukrainian point of view, but uh, I want to present it for you. Ukraine is not intervening to Rus uh, Russian domestic issues, and uh, this uh, policy brief is about modalities of coexisting. I want to uh, st uh, st make an accent that this is not a strategy at all. It's only a vision, a first step toward a strategy. We think that success for Ukraine uh, in this confrontation with Russia is an independent Ukraine that had restored it territorial integr integrity and joined the Western institutions. Uh, we can achieve this success only if we can comp uh, shape a more attractive social model than in Russia that will ensure greater freedom, greater justice, greater protection of human rights at economical, economic efficiency. We, I want to insist that the concentration of Ukrainian state policy on harming Russia can destroy the chances of successful competition with, uh, of the uh, complexion of the confrontation with Russian Federation. And you see, at for unfortunately, this confrontation tend that external enemies, that extern external threats can be a universal excuse for, for our uh, own mistakes. Russian uh, goals toward Ukraine since 2014. It's, I want to insist, it's a Ukrainian vision, and I want to, to, uh, to stress that it's our vision, it's not official position of Ukrainian uh, states at all. It's only uh, research uh, ideas. Fix Ukraine in the gray zone between the West and Russia, uh, not give us to right, right and opportunity to join the EU and uh, the NATO. Uh, restore Ukrainians' unlimited dependence on Russia and achieve to a de facto recognition of the annexation of Crimea by great powers. Sorry for this. Thank you. Uh, since 2014, Russian policy toward uh, Ukraine used political, military, economic, international, soft as well as hard tools. One of the most important tools which Russia created in 2014 is the temporary occupied territories. I mentioned about Crimea as well as Donetsk and Lugansk. Ukrainian goals toward Russia are very easy right now. Guaranteeing the independence and the state sovereignty of Ukraine, restoring uh, the territorial integrity of our, uh, you, uh, of our state, minimize, uh, minimize negative consequences of realization of threats connected with the Russian Federation, and uh, more strategic, proving to Russian leadership and Russian society that attempt to limit Ukrainian uh, sovereignty, it's not a possible uh, task. Uh, restoration of uh, territorial integrity, the main uh, issue in current Ukrainian uh, policy discussion, politics discussion, may be a long term. Uh, we, uh, for the achieving this uh, goal, we have uh, guaranteed Ukrainian social uh, development. 
we have to try to protect the rights and freedoms of citizens of Ukraine, create a system of strategic communications, reject our attempts to legitimize unrecognized quasi-state. I mentioned about uh, so-called Donetsk and Lugansk republics, and uh, to uh, divergent, uh, to understand divergent interests of external and internal players in this uh, situation. Uh, according to the Ukrainian national security strategy of 2020, we have uh, three pillars of Ukrainian national uh, security policy, deterrence, uh, resilience, dialogue or communications. And we try to implement these three pillars for Ukrainian-Russian relations. First of all, a deterrence. We have, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, unfortunately, uh, symmetric military buildup uh, for Ukraine is impossible. Russia is much more stronger. I don't mention even about uh, nuclear power, but if we compare conventional uh, troops, Russia in times uh, bigger and stronger. Our um, uh, goal uh, to develop a symmetric approach and create such security and defense capabilities, which will inflict unacceptable losses on the aggressor on land, in the air, at sea, and in uh, cyberspace. It means that we must more efficient, efficient use resources, including human resources. We have to change the culture of Ukrainian security and defense sector. First of all, the culture in our armed forces. It's very important for us that understanding very easy uh, trust that soldier is a citizen in uniform will change the whole situation in our security uh, and defense uh, forces. Uh, next one, deterrence uh, includes the strengthening international uh, the international support of uh, Ukraine. The second pillar, resilience. Uh, the main problem of Ukraine is the lack of resilience and uh, this that we have uh, too many weaknesses. Our task to reduce these weaknesses and uh, help us to be, to be more united, more cohesion uh, against Russian threat. Communication. We have to keep open channels of communication with Russia with international mediation, uh, clearly identify areas in which trade with uh, Russia is beneficial for Ukraine. Russia is still a very important uh, trade uh, partner for Ukraine. And I want to uh, use this situation to promote the next, uh, next document of our National Institute. Uh, <clears throat> the review of Ukrainian-Russian uh, bilateral economic uh, relations in last 10 years. Uh, continue reviewing the bilateral uh, treaties base. Right now, we still have more than 400 uh, document, document in this sphere and develop pragmatic cooperation with uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, states of the uh, South Caucasus and the Central Asia. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, again, thank you for you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Alexander. I, I think it's very important, especially this capacity to exercise sovereignty that you've uh, underlined throughout several of um, Ukraine, several Ukraine's goals. And I think that that comes to no surprise that Russia was able to achieve perhaps not everything that it planned to achieve by instigating Russian spring in the East and hoping that there will be more secessionist um, sentiment in Ukraine. 
partially because Ukraine's state institution are not effective to protect and project Ukrainian national interest. But I'm sure James Sher will touch upon that point. Uh, and I would like to now pass the floor to you, James. Over to you. Thank you, Rishia. I, I have to express my admiration for the discipline and brevity of my predecessors, and I hope I will equal it. Um, I will surprise some of you by saying that I regard the issue of NATO membership for Ukraine as a dangerous distraction. It is an issue which has diverted us from what the fundamental problems are and from where the solution has to lie. Uh, the main fundamental problems, of course, are to do with Russia and how it views Ukraine. Um, and here my comments, I think, will contrast a bit with Nadia's. The fundamental issue is that for Russians, uh, certainly the Russian leadership, all Russian establishments of significance and a large part of the Russian polity, Ukraine's independence is an abnormality and an aberration. Uh, Russia historically has incorporated Ukraine's identity into its own. It views Ukraine as part of its own history. It is very resistant uh, emotionally, psychologically, to the notion that there is a distinct and separate Ukrainian identity and Ukrainian history. I do not see this going away. I do not have the power, I do not have the ability now to start documenting this and finding examples for it. But there is a clear continuity between the first ambassador, Russian ambassador to Ukraine, who found it appropriate to say on arrival that he regarded Ukraine's independence as a temporary phenomenon, and President Medvedev in 2010 in his negotiations with uh, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, making it perfectly clear that Russia's goal was to synchronize the development of socio and economic relations. And when Yanukovych said, this is too much for, his, for us, uh, he replied, Eta toika nachalo. it's only the beginning. Um, Russia believes that it is entitled to be the arbiter of what Ukraine's independence means and how it is to be pursued. And as long as that is the case, then I think this uh, mutually acceptable uh, solution with Russia's consent is just not realistic. Uh, second point, there has always been a connection between Russia's views about Ukraine uh, uh, fundamentally important as they are in their own right, and its broader threat perceptions and objectives in Europe and elsewhere, and its broader worldview. Um, and to this point, the West and ultimately the United States are viewed in Moscow as the enablers of uh, Ukraine's defiance. Um, the it is very, it's congenitally very difficult for people to accept that for very good reasons, for well, for, for very coherent reasons, Russia has a view of reality, an outlook, a set of interests that is antagonistic to that of the liberal democratic order and the West in essence. My third point about Russia is that um, and this, uh, again, will sound very counterintuitive. I think to this moment, the Russian leadership perceives that time is on Russia's side uh, for two reasons. Russia's interests in Ukraine are cardinal, and they are also seen as permanent. And from a Russian perspective, perhaps with justice, ours are not seen that way. And secondly, they simply do not care how long all of this takes. And the level of pressure that it is politically possible for the West to impose upon Russia is not sufficient to uh, produce a real reassessment um, of the situation. So let me now turn to my second point about the West, because I think the West is also very much a part of the problem but in a different way than um, 
many would suggest. Uh, there has been from the beginning uh, a congenital unwillingness on the part of most Western elites and governments to accept that Russian hostility is a systemic reality. Uh, that there is Russian hostility, yes, that is accepted. But that it's a systemic reality, no. And this has led to a lack of clarity. Because in dealing with this conflict and Ukraine in general, um, whether people consciously admit it or not to others or to themselves, Western governments are still trying to change Russia. And this is getting in the way of the task of protecting Ukraine and broader Western interests. Uh, there is a belief that the right sort of policy mix firmness, dialogue, keeping the door open will persuade Russia to change its attitude about issues that Russia regards as fundamental to its identity um, and interests. And what this has done, on the one hand, it's not impressed Russia at all, um, this approach, and it is also confused and demoralized Ukraine. Now, what would a clear policy have been? Uh, and I think most people here know I'm not saying this for the first time. Um, the clear policy in response to the events of 2014 would have been very simple. To have stated very clearly, uh, we will defend Ukraine by all means short of war. Um, and the second occasion when we could have uh, plainly done this, and it was the critical occasion, uh, was late 2014, when the war changed and Russia's uh, combined arms battle groups uh, entered Ukraine. And that of course led to the Minsk Accords, but that would have been the perfect time for Angela Merkel to have said very clearly, to now we have opposed the rearmament of Ukraine. We will no longer oppose it. To now we have insisted on completion of Nord Stream 2. We will now terminate Nord Stream 2. To now we have confined our sanctions to areas that do not impinge directly on the personal interests of the people who run Russia. All of that is now going to change unless this stop. Uh, and the critical errors we did not um, we did not proceed in that way. Final point on the West, and it's just a question: What is the Biden administration going to change? Uh, that he is going to do his utmost to re reinvigorate the transatlantic relationship, to restore the integrity to that relationship and trust, is beyond question. That his administration is extremely supportive of Ukraine and views the issue as enormously important is also beyond question. That they view Russia as a hostile power is also beyond question. But there are all sorts of enigmas and I will just highlight one. Uh, it's quite clear already that values are intended to play a very important part in this policy. Now, obviously they are implicitly part of the policy and part of our interests. But what part are they meant to play? How does one operationalize this? Is the new administration going to conduct a moralistic policy um, uh, and return to one of lecturing to Russia and shouting to them? Because I, I, I am absolutely convinced uh, this will accomplish nothing at all. The real issue is not what role values play in policy, but are they going to be able, do they understand the importance of devising a long-term strategic approach to living with the problems we have? Now, what I said NATO membership was a dangerous distraction. Um, what should the emphasis be? Alexander, uh, I think, pointed to many of them when he talked about the key internal security objectives and 
uh, socio and economic objectives for Ukraine. What the West needs to do, in my view, and we've done some of it, is help Ukraine establish a firm system of deterrence inside the country that makes a renewal of full-scale hostilities by Russia hazardous, and uh, along with that, um, by investing in stability and resilience, makes the status quo for Russia increasingly unsatisfying and um, allows the LDNR to rot. And all of this needs to be done irrespective of what Russians think about it and what happens in Russia. And that is within the bounds of realism if we're committed to doing it. And if Ukraine has a president and leadership that is committed to doing it, um, which I uh, do not think it has at present. Um, finally, uh, if we look towards the future, number one, there is a process of retrenchment taking place in Russia. It's not a retreat, it's something else. We see signs of it, of course, in the Karabakh war, elsewhere. My uh, friend and interlocutor, Dmitry Suslov, made it absolutely clear in a recent conversation with me, and he underscored the point six or seven times, that it is acceptable to us now to have other actors in former Soviet space, Turkey, China, uh, we can live with that as long as they are helping us diminish the influence of the West. The West remains Glavni Verak, the main enemy. But on the other hand, when it comes to protecting what is um, Svoy, our own, Ukraine, Belarus, absolutely no change. Um, and these areas are part of and must remain part of a Russo-centric space, and we will do everything possible to make sure uh, that they are. So that is taking place. And this, but this is you know, very interesting changes and discussions going on. Um, Russia is investing, second point, is not for the first time investing a great deal in changing the internal dynamics and internal balance in Ukraine uh, with the opposition platform um, and, the, uh, and, uh, and uh, the utilization of the Medvedchuk factor. Uh, but that does not mean that external pressure is absent and I would call your attention, I don't have time to cite it, to Sergei Lavrov's press conference on the 18th of January, where he reiterated some points he made in October and said again, he presented an ultimatum, an ultimatum to France and Germany, to the Normandy partners and said, if you do not compel Ukraine to honor its commitments under Minsk, meaning as we interpret it, then we will have to, on our own, adopt our own measures to rectify um, this situation. He said it on the 18th of January, he said it in October, he said it before. Does that mean he is just saying it to intimidate people or does it mean something might happen? Um, I think we have to be very agnostic about this, but I would just conclude with one point for a number of reasons, I think that it is very likely that the Biden administration will be tested by Russia and quite early. It could be in one domain or another, uh, but Ukraine is even from, from that point of view, uh, a very important place to watch. So I'll leave it there. And I apologize if I have exceeded my speaking time. Thank Thanks. you very much, James. I think uh, it's been fascinating uh, input from all of the speakers to uh, launch our discussion. And I think uh, you could already see some of the points of tension and uh, understand why there is an armed conflict because of, of this, some of these irreconcilable aspirations on one hand of Russian elite, on the other hand of what I would call the nation building project that is taking place in Ukraine. And I not uh, incidentally refer so much to the public opinion in Ukraine because contra contrary to Russia, it very much influences both ruling elites and the direction of the development of the country. So it's always important to take this into account. 
So now I would like to open the floor to your questions, contributions, reflections. Uh, it would be great if you also raise your hands. Uh, we see a lot of our experts, our associate fellows, our regular uh, participants of roundtables. I would love to bring you in also on video. So if you raise your hand, the blue hand in the participant um, function, I'd be able to invite you. And I think it's always nice to hear and see you interacting with our participants. But we have quite a lot of um, questions already in the chat. Uh, and I think I would like to start perhaps with two questions that came um, uh, on this um, uh, on this kind of um, um, problem of not acceptance of Ukraine as, the, as an uh, independent, truly independent state that is able to choose its direction. And uh, this is a question from Richard Wright directed to Nadia. And Richard asks, given the absence of trust between Russia and Ukraine, is not Russia's goal of neutral Ukraine in reality just a policy of perpetuation of the status quo? Because in a way, like Alexander reminded, uh, Ukraine has already been there and had the non-alignment, non-block status written in its constitution, but apparently it didn't reassure uh, Russian leadership enough. So how would you really describe this desire for Ukraine's neutrality? What does it symbolize? Is there something underneath the surface, Nadia? Yes, so the question is about trust, right? It's about trust in our relations, right? It's, it's about taking into account that there is no trust. Yes, this there is, is the no presumption. Trust. You probably but, would agree that current yes. uh, Russian leadership doesn't trust whoever sits now in Bankova. It was Poroshenko before, now Zelensky. Uh -huh. Ma, so, well, yeah. I would like to answer this uh, question, but first, could I react to the okay. <laughs> presentation of James? Sure, yes. James, you'll be surprised, but I'm in a violent agreement with you. <laughs> I, uh, when we say, when we are speculating about the Ukraine conflict, it's not about Ukraine. It's about Russia and the West. Let's accept this. And Ukraine is a victim of these fundamental, uh, fundamental differences between Russia and the West. As for bilateral Russian-Ukrainian relations, you are absolutely right. After the dissolution of the USSR, Russia failed to formulate uh, a new strategy vis-a-vis -vis newly um, uh, independent states. And it was the fault of Yeltsin and his reformers. They failed to do this. They did not know how to treat these countries as an independent uh, countries. And they came back to the old pattern, uh, economic carrots for political loyalty. But we should recognize that uh, newly independent states half-heartedly accepted this model and I think that they partly share responsibility for our current problems because in, um, independence is a very costly thing. You should pay for, for this. So, but I, I, I fully agree with you that Russia's um, attitude was very condescending and on many occasions, Russia demonstrated disregard to Ukrainian in interest and vulnerabilities. Uh, trust, trust does not appear from nowhere. If we look back in time, the best period in our relations with the West was in the Gorbachev time, when trust was being built by uh, uh, by very important uh, uh, agreement on arms control. Trust is being built. Uh, it's, we, we, we cannot take trust for granted. So we should, uh, it's very difficult in this current situation to, well, to talk about trust between Russia and Ukraine. But probably, 
uh, under the best scenario, we would be able to start this process and step by step to reinstate trust in our relation based on legal basis. I don't believe just in emotions and good intentions. It should be based on very solid legal basis. And probably I have answered. <laughs> and, but also, Nadia, there, there was a question linked to neutrality, whether the fact that Russia, Russian leadership would like to see Ukraine as neutral this new uh, what what does this really mean you know in Russian sense neutral uh, well Russia won't insist uh, to um, on, on Ukraine's membership in CSTO it's out of question we understand this but uh, Russia uh, wants Ukraine to stay neutral to stay outside NATO and let, let me explain why I never believed in NATO's military threat. But from the very beginning, I was against NATO's enlargement to the CIS because I knew that it would uh, cause this, uh, this reaction of uh, Russian leadership, of our military. Uh, and NATO, Let's face the truth. NATO is not a collective security institution. It is a military alliance. And when a military alliance uh, is coming closer to your borders, it's either because it wants to, um, it, 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 ha it has uh, intentions uh, to, well, to offend, to offend, let's say. So, uh, or either Russia is a threat to, to NATO, which is not the case because, because uh, NATO is much stronger now than uh, Russia. So for Russia, this question of Ukraine's neutrality is crucial. Mm. However, um, however painful it may look for Ukraine, but it is crucial for Russia, mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine's neutrality. Yeah. I think also, uh, and maybe this question will raise up uh, later about how EU integration is, is being perceived by, oh, yes. by Russia. Very interesting question, yes. because I could answer yeah, immediately. Go, go ahead. Because, you know, from the very beginning, when uh, the EU leadership and NATO leadership uh, declared that the EU and NATO enlargement are two complementary processes, Says I was completely against this um, this position because uh, in the beginning Russia's position was extremely positive. U European Union is not NATO, and uh, the C countries uh, returned to well their natural environment. So it was uh, it was taken uh, in a very positive way, but when when uh, both Brussels declared that these two processes are complementary. First, NATO embraced uh, the EU would be members and only after that they could uh, become the EU members. It changed Russia's position on the EU enlargement in a very negative way. And also we remember that the conflict in Ukraine was triggered by the clash of two regional strategies, Eastern Partnership and the Eurasia concept, Russia's Eurasia concept. But there was a um, widespread opinion in Russian elite that the EU would be membership of the EU integration is only a smoke screen for NATO's enlargement. Okay. All right, thank you very much. So maybe now I'll, I'll turn to Alexander on a similar uh, subject to maybe re reflect on what Nadia said. And also uh, there's a question in particular, you know, I, I see it linked to um, possible neutrality on the, the state of development of Ukrainian armed forces because even a neutral country should, especially I would say neutral country with hypothetically neutral country with the neighbor of Russia 
should have quite a strong armed forces to defend itself. And the question was, how do you compare the development and the state of Ukrainian armed forces from 2014 to today? First of all, I'm very thankful for this opportunity. If you compare the state of Ukrainian armed forces in 2014 and now, Ukrainian uh, forces are quite stronger. We implement uh, quite big efforts in this issue, but unfortunately I can't say that uh, the progress was dramatical. We can say that we now have a new army, a new organization, new weaponry. First of all, uh, the answer why first of all, the answer was would be a very easy, very simple, and understandable. We just don't have uh, money for big military reform. Ukraine spent. 3.4, 3.5% to the military, to our, of our GDP to the military, but with current situation at less than five uh, billion dollars, much or less. And it's not a money which we need for real reweaponization of our army, or particularly when the life cycle of the Soviet um, weaponry, high uh, technological uh, weaponry is about of the end. Uh, Ukrainian aviation, Ukrainian air defense, etc. Uh, the most modern uh, planes, the most modern missiles were bought in the Soviet time. Now we have more, uh, about 30 years after uh, this. The second one about uh, issue of neutrality. The first Ukrainian huge foreign affairs and security steps was the cancelling of uh, Ukrainian nuclear status and cancelling of uh, nuclear <clears throat> of right to the nuclear uh, capability. Uh, Ukraine President Leonid Kuchma signed Budapest memorandum and in 2014, we saw the results of this uh, uh, signing. I don't say that it was not right. Uh, it was not right. It was right. We didn't have an, other opportunity, other choice. But unfortunately, we don't have any opportunities to believe for further Russian guarantees for other Russian uh, suggestion. Even more, when in 2010, Ukraine tried to change our non, so-called non-block, non-alignment position, it was only first step for further Russian suggestion about the custom union, etc., etc., etc. What reason uh, I kindly ask to Nadezhda to other uh, our member participants: What reason for why we have? Why do we have to believe to Russia that? Counseling of current NATO uh, policy, NATO and London policy, will uh, tend for security and peace in the relation uh, with Russia. I strongly understand Russian reason. I strongly understand that uh, too many people in Russian elite. Uh, consider NATO as a direct uh, threat to 
not only Russian interest, uh, but uh, to existing of Russia. But we try uh, to counseling our NATO uh, aspiration, NATO aspiration. It was, uh, it, what is, uh, what was the result? I even not, uh, don't want to speak about uh, internal uh, consequences of this uh, decision. From my personal point of view, it would tend to a real uh, civil conflict or even uh, collapse of current of Ukrainian uh, state. But I only ask about foreign dimensions. We don't have uh, any trust to Russia at all. I strong uh, uh, agree with uh, Nadezhda idea about small steps in building uh, uh, trust. But uh, very, uh, but we have to start from uh, something, and this could be uh, counseling, uh, supply, military, uh, uh, military supply to Donetsk and R Lugansk, counseling of Russian military presence in Donetsk and Lugansk. It would be great sign of changing of Russian uh, change, of changing Russian approach to Ukraine. Uh, thank you, Alexander. I, I, I bet that Kremlin wouldn't agree that this is a small step what you are asking in terms of can canceling supply. But the, it, you know, we, we heard you, we've heard you. And, and, and now I would like to, to turn to James, uh, staying on this issue because you, you, you started your um, uh, today's intervention with saying that you don't agree NATO is, is, is a viable option. Or I'm, I'm sorry, don't exactly remember your quote, but here is the question from Ustab Krivdik who says, presumably NATO is not an option for Ukraine which he strongly disagrees, what are the viable and realistic options to sustain that neutrality uh, of Ukraine? And perhaps, James, linked to that, you can reflect on what you have heard from Alexander on these three pillars for Ukrainian national security, which is deterrence, resilience, and dialogue. Would you, would you say these are solid, good pillars that Ukraine should focus on, or something's missing? Let me... Um, uh, let me come back to the NATO and neutrality issue. What I said is that the NATO issue is a dangerous distraction. I think it would be deeply damaging um, if uh, through legal agreement or simply policy agreement, um, Ukraine were put in a different lesser category as a state that has no right to be considered and should not explore this question. Now, there's a practical issue here also. When Yanukovych and the parliament at that time uh, agreed by law that Ukraine was henceforth a non bloc state, what happened within a matter of weeks? The Russians said, you are, dis you are not honoring your own commitment because there are still NATO officers here. That operate. You still have NATO people here. So by neutrality, they clearly meant more than simply a, um, a um, reconsideration of uh, joining NATO. Um, you know, this is the basic issue. I was of one mind and still am of one mind with the Ukrainian military leadership who I knew and worked with in the 1990s, who said, our objective is to integrate with NATO as much as we can de facto, but never de jure, because if we integrate, try to join NATO de jure, Russia will tear us apart. And I think that analysis was still a solid analysis afterwards. So in answer to Astap, my good friend Astap, let me reintroduce a distinction which we have lost in these European security discussions between neutrality, which always has to be agreed uh, with others, um, 
and a policy of non-alignment, whereby a country preserves its full sovereignty but decides for itself just um, what level of military and other relationships it will have uh, with other states. Sweden is an outstanding example. Sweden and Finland now, of course, are de facto very much part of the workings of NATO, but they are not the Uri part of it. So this is a prerogative that must rest with Ukraine, in my view. Um, I, uh, I fully agree, I, I, I fully endorse the first two pillars uh, that um, Sasha uh, presented. The third pillar dialogue, I understand why it is there. I'm not opposed to it being there, but I'm opposed to it being a pillar because <laughs> I don't think the problems began or the conflict began because of an absence of dialogue. I don't think there has been an absence of dialogue since at some levels there has been more intensive dialogue than there was before. There were 30 telephone conversations between Obama and Putin and the number of meetings between Merkel and Putin since 2014, much more than before. I don't think this will be solved by dialogue, mm -hmm. but communication is very important, particularly institutionalized communication between the Western military establishments and their Russian opposite numbers, between political establishments and their opposite numbers, security establishments and their opposite numbers, all this must go on. But let's, you know, be realistic that this is not going to take us out of the woods. Thank you, James. And I'm grateful to Alexei Melnik for the Razumkov Center who just uh, messaged me the recent uh, public attitudes to the uh, full uh, cancellation of perspective of NATO membership and including in the constitution uh, the neutrality status. So the 57% uh, of Ukrainians are against this proposal, even if it helps to achieve peace on Donbass and 28 are for it. So this is this kind of a public opinion that whoever is the president of Ukraine has to deal with because of a profound sense of insecurity and um, uh, threat that Ukrainians feel, of course, more in the center west, uh, less in the east of Ukraine feel as emanating from Russia. But um, I would like to now give a floor to Duncan Allen. Duncan, if you could, uh, if we could please unmute Duncan to um, uh, give him a floor. Um, thank you, Arisia. And thank you to our three speakers as well for their excellent contributions so far. Um, I'd like to go back to this question of Russia's objectives, please. I know this has already been covered, but I still think there are things here we need to try and clarify. We've heard a lot of talk about how Russia wants to see a neutral Ukraine. I would argue, however, that Russia wants far more than that. And this is clear from what Russia demands of Ukraine in the context of the, of the Minsk agreement. Um, Russia demands a, a form of special status for the regimes in Eastern Ukraine, which would in effect lead to the establishment of many states beyond the control of the central authorities in Ukraine, which would give Russia a lasting influence over Ukraine's political and constitutional system. Now, to my mind, that goes way beyond ideas of neutrality. As far as I'm aware, Russia's position on this issue has not changed since the second Minsk agreement was signed. But am I wrong? Thank you, Duncan. Nadia, over to you. Is Duncan wrong or right? Or somewhere in the middle? Uh, but, uh, well, Duncan is right, uh, but uh, there is no secret because it is written in the Minsk agreement that uh, the Ukraine southeastern regions should be more autonomous and it is in the, on the political agenda of the Minsk agreement, so I don't see any contradiction. But the crucial issue for Russia, of course, is, uh, is neutrality. Okay. Um, I think also there was, uh, in a way, Russia carried the flag of federalization of Ukraine. Now we hear less about it. Uh, and to me, in a way, it symbolized 
more fractured Ukraine that Russia would like to see in order to exercise some of these influences, building on regional diversity of Ukraine as we know it. And then interestingly enough, we do see some of the connections through Hungary with the Hungarian community living in the Zakarpatia region where ethnic minorities are being to some extent weaponized to preclude building cohesive Ukrainian nation. And this is where history comes and language comes. And then we did see a recent statement of Patrushev again on the language law in Ukraine. So do you see Russia position remaining the same, changing, or it's nothing new under the sun, as James said? Uh, of course, Russia's position is evolving in details, but uh, I would like to come back to uh, Alexander's presentation because I liked one, one point. In, in my view, the best answer uh, to those people in Russia or in other countries who doubt uh, U Ukraine's sovereignty will be uh, economic prosperity good governance, um, effective uh, reforms, efficient reforms. But uh, it, uh, all these uh, well, goals cannot be achieved in the situation when the war is going on. And uh, who will invest in Ukraine in the situation of the current low intensity warfare, nobody. So peace in Ukraine is the main precondition for all other problems. And uh, Alexander uh, said about, generally speaking, I'm not uh, a fan of small steps. Uh, when I was, uh, I was talking about uh, trust, uh, well, trust is impossible now. The question of trust in our relations is, uh, is impossible even to discuss after incorporation of Crimea, after you know, all these casualties. Let us uh, leave uh, trust for the future. And we should start with a big step. We should stop the war and step by step after that we should um, resolve this, uh, this we should entangle this knot uh, and we have the roadmap the minsk agreement so um, what's what's the question was <laughs> it, it, it's okay i think you, you've it's reflected on on what you've heard in uh, alexander's presentation and i also do agree with you that in a way consolidation inside ukraine into a prosperous and, and uh, yes, successful and, uh, nation against all the odds you know you could uh, you could argue both ways that in a way war also consolidated an effort of the ukrainian state and we have seen a very strong impetus for reform including in the armed forces including in the security sector when the war was actually raging when so much of ukrainian society backed uh, you know state institutions uh, of course right now the, there's a big question of where ukraine reforms are going and whether this momentum is is reversing backwards but this is not necessarily the subject of today's discussion i'm sure we'll discuss it and uh, let me just, yeah. just a few words about another point that i liked very much in alexander's presentation an external enemy is a universal excuse for all mistakes this can be referred to Russia as well. Mm. But for many uh, politicians in Ukraine who are not able to implement uh, a well thought economic strategy, an external enemy is, is a good excuse. So uh, that's why we need peace in Ukraine. We need this peacekeeping operation to stop the war and after that to implement uh, the Minsk agreement. Thank you, Nadia. Before I turn to James and Alexander, I see both of your hands, but I would like to bring in Pavlo Hazan. I imagine Pavlo is joining us from, from Kyiv. Pavlo, if you could please introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. I'm Pavlo Hazan. I'm a scientist, environmentalist and physicist. Uh, from Ukraine, yes, but not from Kyiv, from the city of Dnipro. And um, 
Uh, also, I am veteran of uh, Russian-Ukrainian war. I am former armed forces officer who served for four years um, on military zone. And um, I have some questions uh, to speakers. Uh, one question in the continuing what um, my friend Ostap Krivdik said about the, any other solutions except of NATO, because from my understanding, as a former officer, uh, NATO is a one of a goal for Ukraine because uh, during this time, but when I when I was in the Ukrainian army, because I'm I'm not a professional uh, military, not professional military man, I, I'm a scientist. But um, uh, for us, uh, NATO was an example, and uh, was a, a is a one of the very important goal that Ukraine will be a member of NATO. I fully understand. I understood what James said about formal things, about official and non-official, and this uh, to be an official member or to be a friend of NATO. Uh, this question, another question, may be more philosophic. Is that war, is European war, or this war is Ukrainian war? Because uh, for my understanding, when I've been to zero, line. Uh, my understanding was that we, wa we was defending Europe as a wall, not, not only Ukraine. And my third question may be more for Alexander. Is it right that uh, Ukraine uh, still have uh, trade relations with Russia? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pavlo. So we'll we'll start with Alexander, and then we'll go over to James. Alexander. First of all, I'm uh, answer to I'm answering to Pavlo, and after this, uh, I try to say a few words to Nadia. Uh, yes, Ukraine have a quite big amount of official trade with Russia. First of all, in issue of energy including coal and uh, not only in energy. Uh, I can uh, make mistake right now, but we have to say about uh, five, seven billion dollars per year. And if from 2014, to 2017, the, this amount was decreasing. After 2017, it's uh, increasing. It's first of all, which, which I want to answer for your third question. The second uh, one about uh, relations with NATO. According to the Ukrainian constitution, uh, the NATO joining the EU and the NATO is a one of it's a strategic course of Ukrainian uh, state, and uh, right uh, now it's a very clear norm of our legislation uh, about different. Uh, opportunities the uh, different uh, to NATO opportunistic to guarantee our security and defense it's possible uh, to discuss uh, many ideas it's possible to say about treaty such as or Austrian. It's possible to, in 1955, it's possible to say about others' approaches, but the issue of all kind of guarantees, it's a trust and poss possibility to defend itself. Right now, 
if we compare Russian and Ukrainian military potential, we simply don't have enough forces to defend itself. And NATO seems as one possible uh, solution. Uh, to Nadia, thank you so much for your world. I absolutely, I do, do, do agree with you that peace is vital issue uh, for Ukraine. Uh, this war became war for attrition. We drain our resources, not only physical, but first of all, moral. And uh, even now, after the 18 uh, ceasefire, we right now have 18 ceasefire, we lost uh, uh, more than 15 uh, people. It's a huge, it's, we can't compare this with the situation of 2014 or 2015 when we lost uh, in uh, August more than 400 persons per day. In uh, the situation of Ilovaisk and in the Balsava when we lost more than 100 persons, we can't compare this amount, but we still have casualties. We still must deploy quite big forces in Donetsk and Lugansk, and it's exhausted our resources and don't allow us to raise uh, uh, our capacities. Uh, I don't want to say even about investments, etc., etc., etc. Too many uh, things which uh, we can uh, say. But for tango, we need both sides. To uh, we have uh, and we need two persons. Tango. Uh, it seems. I, I am saying it seems that uh, current Russian uh, leadership is abs absolutely satisfied by the current uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And we don't see any real approaching uh, any small or huge step uh, toward Ukrainian position in uh, the Minsk uh, processes. I do, Ukraine, re, from my personal point of view, we have reached the limit of our uh, concessions in this situation. We agreed with uh, Steinmeier formula. We agreed with uh, other very strong issues. We are discussing very painful issues uh, uh, for our society, etc. But uh, it seems that our counterparts in these uh, negotiations consider ne negotiations not as a tool for achieving agreement, but it tool for harming Ukraine, for subverse Ukrainian internal stability and resilience. Thank you, Alexander. It, so I'm so uh, sorry it's, for that. Yeah, it's, it's great. I think you, you pointed to an important tactic that Russia uses during negotiations. Uh, and we see a lot of information or disinformation around Minsk uh, also emanating from various um, Russia proxy media uh, resources. But now I'd like to turn to James and give him maybe three, four minutes to finish because we are running now out of time. Uh, and I think it would be great if you could reflect to that important question from, from Pavlo, whether in the West or in Europe in particularly, this war is viewed as such as it is by the Ukrainian servicemen on, on the front line in Donbass. Um, three to four minutes, I might just do it. 
First, something that only Nadia mentioned, and I must come back to, it's very important, which is the EU. Not as part of NATO, but as the EU. Um, I love being in violent agreement with Nadia. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, I think that the EU in its own right, and Ukraine's membership of it, is very threatening to Russia because what the EU represents is an alternative normative system, economically and politically. And for this system to encroach in an area that Russia effectively considers an extension of its homeland is impermissible. So I will that's, I'll just leave that there. Uh, coming back to Pavlov's points, and uh, Sasha a bit too, I think Ukraine underestimates itself. Let us not forget that those who framed and began to implement the Nova Russia project in 2014 actually thought as a result of this, Ukraine would simply fall apart. And they were very surprised by the, by the rebound that was there. I think that in its shambolic way, uh, Ukraine as a country, not as a state, is far more resilient than people think. It has demonstrated resilience very, very often. Um, there is a level of good, professional, prudent inhibition on the part of Russia's military planners about widening the war with Ukraine. And so all that I am suggesting that is realistic is that it is possible through a considerable degree of integration with NATO and more effective assistance to create, to strengthen the system of deterrence mm -hmm. that makes the renewal of full-scale hostilities, uh, a very costly and very risky proposition for Russia. I think that's realistic. The worst outcome for Ukraine would be if somehow all the NATO members just forgot about practicalities and we said, fine, you're members of NATO. For Russia then to launch a military offensive and for us to do nothing. Do not forget, please, in 1939, Poland had a treaty of alliance with France and Britain. What was the result? You know, we have to consider in the world we live in, practical real results and consequences. And that often means looking at lesser for lesser evils. And my last point, again, coming back to Pablo. If Ukraine had collapsed in 2014, I think I am, of course, living in Estonia. You could see some of it outside. I think that in Central Europe, on the states bordering Russia to the West, we would be in a far more parlous situation in terms of security than we are now because Ukraine revived and reconsolidated itself. So there is a connection between what happens there and what happens in Europe. There's a political connection. Sergei Lavrov himself in 2014 drew a connection between events in Ukraine and the policy we pursue here in this country towards Russia's so-called compatriots living here. Mm -hmm. So these connections are there. Um, that's it. Well, thank you very you much, talk James. A lot I, I, I think perhaps one of the ways forward, which, you know, I guess we, we haven't, we, we have identified some, but not too many, which is, that's why we need to have more conversations like that, you know, amongst friends who wish well for both countries, is perhaps Ukraine getting more confidence on its own, getting more uh, consolidation of its nations through its governance, through its military, and in a way, enhanced opportunities partnership that is now being offered to Ukraine offers that similar Swedish or Finnish model that we have discussed uh, as an example. And then it, there will be some breathing space for looking at these bilateral relations into more um, brighter light. But I think this is somewhere midterm down the way, meaning while unfortunately the two countries are locked in a irreconcilable hostility and this strategy of attrition on behalf of Russia and the way to survival and mobilization on the side of Ukraine leaves us where we are. We will definitely as Chatham House keep a focus on that this year and in the years to come and I would like to thank all our speakers Nadia, Alexander, James for
for sharing your insights, for being very open with us. We'll be posting this video online uh, and we will be looking forward to welcoming you at our next discussions at Chatham House Ukraine Forum and wider Russia and Eurasia program. Thank you very much. Uh, we're wishing you a very nice day and stay well. Bye-bye.